Hey everyone, welcome to the Movie Mance q and I'm your host, Scott Movie Mance. Very excited to have a conversation about the film, Working Man. The film is about a working man named Allery Parks, lives with his wife in a small rustic town, worked for decades at a factory. The factory closes, he loses his job, he loses his purpose. So now what? That's just the beginning. Let's take a look at the film. You just disappear. You're not here. I am. I was. Allery, we can't have you in here. We just can't. Why are you doing this? It's just something I need to do. It's a small town. It's hard to keep secrets around here. You want in that factory? They ain't gonna arrest us all, Allery. You did this? Well, not me. They're out there because of you. former workers have re-entered the plant and pledged to fulfill the outstanding orders promised to clients. I just want to do my job. And joining me right now from Working Man is the Working Man himself, Peter Geerty. Hello, and thank you for joining me on this conversation about Working Man. My pleasure. Okay, I'm just going to cut to the chase here. Could this movie be any more timely and relevant in our day and age? I don't know how. I really don't know how. I, they, they didn't start with that in mind, of course. You know, Bob, the uh, jury's been working on this for 10 years, but he comes from uh, an area in the Midwest that has had a lot of factories uh, closed, that has gone through all kinds of economic upheavals. And, uh, and I think also there was something personal in his family history, which I'm not really privy to. I mean, I could guess that, but I don't want to. Um, but there was something personal to him about this, and he just decided he wanted to he wanted to write. Um, you know, I think that there was a moment. I hope Bob is listening or isn't listening. <laughs> but I think there was a moment where he actually uh, had a conversation with a guy who said uh, that his factory was closing, and what if there was a guy that just didn't accept that and went back and and just continued to plug away at it, uh, even though the factory had closed down and. And uh, Bob said, wait a minute, there's a story here and started writing. Oh, that was man. quite a long time ago. So who knew, who knew about the crap that we are mired in now and that the world is mired in, really the world. I mean, it's just amazing to me that it's not just America, that it's international. And you have these same conversations being uh, held in, uh, talked about in uh, Scandinavian languages or, you know, French or Spanish or Italian. I mean, all of these people are suffering the same uh, same fate as we are. I mean, it's really something, you know, yeah, like, really you know this, this movie, you know, it, it debuted last year, uh, I believe, at the Palm Springs or the Santa Barbara Film Festival. Santa Barbara. And, yeah. uh, and just, you know, that was a year ago and the, so much has changed. I mean, mm -hmm. I found myself relating to this movie in ways. I mean, I went through my whole midlife crisis trying to find out like what's my purpose now <laughs> after all of this yeah. but, but yeah. I would say Peter I have been watching your work in film for well a very very long time decades yeah. but this movie is a first for you this is your first lead role yeah. in a film yeah. and we're gonna we're gonna get into all the all the amazing directors you've worked with over the years and it's basically yeah. everybody but how did this come about how did you find Robert Jury, or how did he find you? Don't know. I don't know. I think I think maybe similarly to you, he he had been uh, he had seen me in in various things. Um, you know, I spent something like twenty one years working for a really fine repertory theater in Providence, Rhode Island, Trinity Rep. Uh, me and. Uh, um, Richard Jenkins, a whole bunch of wonderful actors came out of that theater and, you know, doing nothing but Shakespeare and Chekhov and Gorky and all of that wonderful stuff for uh, 20, over 20 years. And then came to New York to do a Broadway show with um, uh, Jed Hirsch and uh, called Conversations with My Father. And of course, when you come to New York, you're, you start auditioning for and getting roles in film and television. And that was 1991. So that's, that's you know, 30 years ago. 
and luckily I wound up getting cast by Tom Fontana in Homicide and that led to The Wire and I got very, very lucky. I wound up being hired by wonderful people and working with actors. Uh, I was working with Ned Beatty and just like watching him like a hawk and learning from him how do you do I knew how to do the stuff on stage but I didn't know how to do it in front of a camera and and so I wound up doing a lot of comedic roles but also a lot of just good solid roles in sometimes small but really good solid roles in film and I think Bob Jury may have picked up on a couple of them and said well that's a possibility right there and I'm so glad that he did you know I'm really glad that he did because it it became an opportunity to not only work on this fine uh, script and but also with just such excellent people, mm-hmm. just such. Once again, I just felt like I I lucked out. I mean, how do you get luckier than to have Talia Shire be your wife? <laughs> you know, and she's such a wonderful person, but she's such a wonderful actor, and she's got this the heart of a lion in the body of a little bird or something and uh, she just uh, it's just wonderful to watch her billy brown and you know i don't know uh, i could go on and on uh, uh, all of those years working at trinity rep in providence i uh, i was working with such a fine company and i always said to myself you know if i ever leave uh, providence if, if i ever am foolish enough to leave this company what i want to do is go to chicago because in Chicago, you've got Steppenwolf, and you've got the Goodman Theater, and you've got Wisdom Bridge, and you've got uh, this amazing um, uh, community of really fine, tough, working-class actors. Well, when we came to do Working Man, that's who we found. Mm-hmm. That's who's in this thing. That's who peoples the factory with us. Just really, really fine actors. Well, well, because this is, I mean, you're in virtually every scene of this movie. What kind of, what kind of challenges was, did that bring on for you? I mean, after all this time, I mean, you know, working with like, you know, Clint Eastwood and, and uh, Spike Lee and Spielberg, and, and now here you are, you're in every scene. How did this push you like no other film, no other role? Because I had to figure out how to uh, connect with this guy who, um, is in the middle of yet another crisis in his life. Mm-hmm. And, and, and one of the things that I've learned, uh, that I learned years and years ago, I, 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 um, the first uh, off-Broadway theater uh, I ever got was, I uh, was hired <laughs> to uh, play a walk-on role with James Earl Jones when he was doing Othello. And it was his first Othello. He did about four, but this was his first. And he was hungry and he just wanted it. And that Othello ran for, I think, 267 performances. And I don't think that there was one performance where I didn't watch Jimmy Jones every single night through the little stage manager's window. My eyes glued to him. See, how the hell does he do this? How does he do it? And I talked to him one day and my brother-in-law, Tom Hill, was also a brilliant actor, um, said this almost the exact same thing to me. And he said, you know, things don't start when you're starting in a a scene or starting in a role or starting in a movie or whatever it is. They don't start in the beginning and they don't start at the end. Mm. They're in the middle of something. You're Mm. you're always in the middle of something. Allery Parks as the working man, as the working man, I was in, I knew that. I just knew that instinctually. I'm in the middle of something. What am I in the middle of? I'm getting older. I'm 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 wobbling on my feet. I'm I, I'm, I'm walking with a hitch in my step. Um, but some but I have a past life, and not only that, there's a future that none of us know about, and that's true right now. That's what that's one of the things that makes this film so uh, impactful to me personally that I know that Allery has a life coming down the line when he's doing that walking along the streets in that town and the other guys are calling from their porches and saying, Allery, what the hell are you doing? The factory's closed down. He's not just walking aimlessly, I don't think. 
So I had to figure out what the hell is going on in my Allery's mind walking to the, it's, he's not going to throw himself off a cliff. Something's <laughs> going to happen. He just doesn't know what it is yet. And something has off, off already happened, which is profound yeah. in his life. Yeah. So he's in the middle of this trying to figure out, trying to figure out what it is that's happening. And the curiosity of the human spirit, the curiosity of thinking, okay, I'm in the middle of this. I'm not quite sure who I am anymore, but I'm just going to put the left foot and then the right foot and then follow it with the left foot and keep going until things get revealed to me. And sure enough, they do. With the intercession of Billy Brown, with the intercession of the community, uh, events occur. And things become revealed, you know. And so as an actor, I think I know that. And I just want to hang on and see how do I, I don't know how to, I don't know exactly the words. How do I, how do I, how do I figure it out? And how do I let a little bit of it out of the bag every minute or two in order to help the audience also figure it out? But really, it's me. If I can figure it out, or if I can hang in there, if I can define what the problem is, that's really what it is. It's not that I ever define what the answer is. It's if I can just define what the problem is, then the watchers, the audience, sitting in a darkened movie theater or wherever the hell <laughs> Or living room. <laughs> or in their li darkened living room, right? <laughs> you know, they'll figure it out. They'll, they'll be there with me. And that's all I want. And it's all in that figuring it out, all in that discovery, because yeah. like for the first like, I don't know, 20 minutes of the film, I, I thought I knew where it was going to go. I thought yeah. I knew this guy. I thought I knew Allery. And yeah. then, like you said, there's something about his past that comes yeah. to light. And then this whole, you know, I don't want to say anything about where the film goes, because for people mm -hmm. watching, if they have not seen this movie yet, make sure you watch it on demand and mm -hmm. watch it because where this movie goes, you have no idea. And it is, it is an amazing journey. And it is also just so rewarding to see this arc, this yeah. arc for Allery. Uh, how fast was this shoot? Like how many days? Huh. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I, I forget. I've heard Bob Jury say this. Uh, Bob Jury, for those who don't know, is the gentleman who from the Midwest who wrote it and uh, I think experienced it and also wound up directing it. And he's a first time uh, film writer and a first time director. Huh. He just did a wonderful job. He was very, 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 very smart in so far as for the most part, uh, after having written a wonderful script with rich, rich roles, he let the actors he gave the actors their head uh, because he hired good people. And so you hire good people and you let them do what they do. Um, uh, but I think that they did a lot of hunting to find the exact right factory, a plastics factory with these giant machines that you feed raw plastic to through tubes at the top and you've got it programmed to spit out the stuff, whatever it spits out. And in my case, my machine was spitting out those little reflectors that go on the back of bicycles, for instance, or, you know, backpacks or cars even or whatever, or cup holders or the stuff that, uh, that the world uh, America uses in their day-to-day -day life. That's what this stuff spits out. But they, they wound up finding the exact right factory um, McCray Industries, I believe it was called, and that factory was working. It was a working factory, and it was functioning. Half of it was functioning while we were filming in it. Oh, oh, is that right? While we were filming in it, and the guy who was the manager of the factory couldn't have been more helpful. I mean, he was amazing. He would just come over, and I don't know, maybe. They, I, I assume he was getting a little bit of money, but they were not a lot for sure. But he was coming over and helping me set up my plastics machine, which 
I didn't know <laughs> anything about, and he's helping me with it and everything. And and um, but I think that uh, Scott, I think that we filmed that thing in seven days. Well, what? I mean, there were seven. I I think maybe eight. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> no, but I, I don't mean the whole thing. But in the factory, we yeah. were only in the factory for like seven or eight days or something. And then That's we had crazy. other, you know, other scenes. Like there was there was a lot of walking involved in the daytime, mm -hmm. and uh, and scenes from the porch uh, with the uh, with the my fellow uh, factory workers who had also been laid off, and they're all there. I'm, you know, we're all neighbors. The entire neighborhood, the entire community has suffered this disaster. And they're sitting up on the porch grilling something and they're saying, Allery, where the hell do you think you're going? Yeah. Why, yeah. Why, where are you going? You know, you know, just because you, and, and uh, I don't answer them. I don't respond to them. And I know them. They're neighbors. I know them. But I don't respond to them because um, I, a, I don't want to get into the conversation. Yeah, there is no, there is no answer in my brain at that moment of where I'm going or what I'm doing. I just know that something's going to get revealed. Something is going to happen, and I, that's all I know. So there were all of these scenes of walking and at nighttime walking. In these scenes were shot in uh, Joliet, Illinois. These were all little towns around Chicago mm -hmm. and, and Joliet, Illinois was the town that we chose that Bob Jury chose and Piero Basso, the wonderful uh, um, uh, cinematographer chose to be the scenes where I wa I would walk at night because Allery has a lifetime habit of walking at night, mm -hmm. which also refers back to the thing that happened earlier on yep. in, his, in his life. Mm -hmm. And he walks at nighttime, and there's this beautiful lighting of this factory town at night with this bridge that goes over a river, and it's just exquisite. And in my mind, and I don't know, well, I don't know should I, I should say this, but in, in my mind, walking over a bridge at night when you're in such a state of not knowing. Despair. Where, of despair. And you, uh, and I always used to think, uh, well, and then I would stop thinking that. And Bob Jury, I mentioned it Bob Jury once, and he said, I, I don't know, whatever it was, that's not that's not what's happening. Mm -hmm. That's not what I'm what Allery's waiting for. But the thought crosses your mind well, late at night in despair when you're walking across a railroad bridge over a river all right right and it's wow. just it's beautiful it's really beautiful you know so, uh, so in other words all i'm saying is there were scenes there were different scenes there's a scene and when walter uh makes a wonderful dinner for us in his house there are scenes that have to do with that aren't in the factory but i think that the scenes in the factory were shot in eight days <laughs> amazing amazing like like when i look at your career you know because like watching this film, watching Working Man, I'm like, oh my God, that yeah, I know that guy. He's been in everything. So I, I wanted to want you to do me a favor. So yeah. I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna bring up a film of a, okay. a film that you worked on. Now mind you, I have a memory like a sieve. So we're... Okay. <laughs> all right, all right, wait a minute. So so what I'm gonna okay, do, yeah. I'm gonna make it really easy for you, Peter, because mm. I'm gonna name the film. I'll uh, name the director and just tell me the first thing that comes to mind. Yeah. It could be uh, a scene that you shot. It could be uh, the actor you worked with. It could be, you know, yeah. maybe the craft services that day, the donuts. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, go ahead. So, Good so game. I, we'll play this, this game. Uh, the, well, actually, the, the first, uh, uh, you know, film that really stuck out for me uh, is, and this is a director you worked with a couple times, Mike Nichols. And, mm -hmm. you know, first Wolf, with Jack Nicholson right. in 94. Right. Like, what are your, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Jack Nicholson, but, Wolf, Mike uh, Nicholson. Okay, uh, I didn't, uh, Jack Nicholson, what a pro. Uh, I had very little to do with him because he would, he rarely left his trailer. Uh, <laughs> I didn't have, re I really didn't have scenes with Jack Nicholson. But what I do remember with Wolf, because there was a scene where um, uh, James Spader, I believe, 
was playing the other guy who gets like affected, infected by the werewolf. Uh, and he, um, he was after, um, he was trying to get into the um, uh, mansion or the grounds of the mansion that Jack Nicholson was at. And uh, there were these huge black iron ornate gates that were closed. And I was just this little gate guard in my little gate guard house, right? And he comes out and I say, I'm sorry, I can't let you in. I know the guy, I, know, I can't let him in. It's, uh, I got orders. And, and I say, and he says, come on, I'm going in there. And he's got this werewolf thing going in him. <laughs> and he says, I say, get back up, back up. So he backs his Jeep up and then he revs it forward and he essentially strains me through the wrought iron gate. Now, in order to do that, they had to build, and there was this, I wish I could remember this guy's name. He's a genius makeup man from Hollywood. And he made, he made another me. I mean, they had a body. It was an animatronic body that when it got hit by the Jeep, it would bend in, in such a way and, uh, and a face. You know, and and he took a, a life mask of me, wow. and I had to, and I had to be screaming at the time. And I have a photograph of this because he dressed me. He dressed this puppet basically in a um, in a um, in a gate guard uniform, and I'm in a gate guard uniform. And I have a photograph with this my arm around me, screaming. Oh, oh right? yeah, I get that. <laughs> and, and, and it's like, and it's totally like, it's my father. Oh, cool. It's totally like my father who's screaming, and I've got my arm around his shoulders. Anyway, that's the only thing I remember about. Okay, but you work with Mike Nichols again, and this time yeah. with Tom Hanks for 2007 in a film that I love. I thought it was mm -hmm. one of the best movies of 2007, Charlie, Charlie Wilson's, Wilson's War. War. Yeah. Tell me about yeah. that. First memory. First memory is just that, uh, okay, I have two memories. R run really quickly was that I had done a, um, a, a one-man show in, at Trinity Rep in Providence, in fact, that Richard Jenkins directed, and um, it was called Billy Bishop Goes to War, and it's a real story about a World War I Canadian kid who goes over to England, joins the RAF, and he becomes a, an ace fighter pilot. I mean, only the Red Baron shot down more, uh, <sighs> more planes than he did, right? He's, uh, and and uh, I had done that on stage at Trinity Reverend Providence and also the Dallas Theater Center. And Mike Nichols, when he hired me for Charlie Wilson's War, brought me into his office and he said, I just want you to tell me how come he said, I directed, me, Mike Nichols directed, Billy Bishop Goes to War on Broadway. Why was your production at Trinity so successful and mine sucked? <laughs> Which was his word. Wow. <laughs> and I said, Mike, I think it's because Richard Jenkins directed it in such a way that it was like your nutcase uncle telling stories about the war, pulling a lampshade on his head, being all these different characters. And it was like you were in a bar, one of those kind of hopeless VFW bars or something with war memorabilia all over the place. And he's hopping up on the bar, just sitting there and telling you stories and becoming different characters and telling you stories. Mike Nichols, when he directed Billy Bishop Goes to War on Broadway, he had a full-size actual airplane rolled onto the stage. It was overproduced. And that's my first memory of Charlie Wilson's Go to War, Goes to War. My second memory of Charlie Wilson's Goes to War, other than being Emily Blunt's dad, and <laughs> there's no uh, bad thing at all in the world she about hanging, I, hanging I, out with Emily Blunt. <laughs> I adore Emily Blunt. I just <laughs> She's just wonderful. fabulous yeah. and gorgeous and just a beautiful, wonderful actress. And, um, but the thing is that I spent a good part of a day or more um, working with Tom Hanks. And Tom, five years ago, I did a Broadway show called, uh, um, I'll remember it in a minute, with uh, Tom Hanks. And it was uh, Nora Ephron's last 
script and it ran and we did it on Broadway and it was called Lucky Guy and we worked together for six, seven months and I considered myself a, a good friend of Tom's. Oh, he's the nicest, nicest, finest man in the history of men. Yes, it's, it's, it's the truth. Yeah. It's the truth. Yeah, but uh, Charlie Wilson's War was my first experience with that cat. Oh, he, he, that, that yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I mean, just over the years from all the times I've, I've had the yeah. pleasure to interview him, just like a true definition of a, of a class act and class act, funny, generous. Mm. Uh, I don't know. There aren't enough adjectives to name, to, to say about the guy. Well, you know what, Peter, one of my favorite remakes, I, I'm not a big fan of remakes yeah. because you know, in most cases, the remakes aren't as good as the original. But I think one movie that topped its uh, its predecessor anyway is War of the Worlds, <laughs> 2005. Tom Cruise, Steven Spielberg, take yeah. it away, Peter. What do you got? <laughs> I w I'll tell you exactly what I got. Um, you know, I was in that. Uh, it was in the first, I don't know, five minutes of the movie when... Uh, Tom Hanks is playing the guy that loads those container ships and he's way the hell up uh, above the river or whatever. And uh, he comes down and he's, and he's going home. And I just played his boss. I come running after him and say, you can't go home. You can't. I need you back here. You got to get back here. And he says, no, nah, I'm not coming back. Uh, that, that was it. And then the monsters come out. So, you know, within, f within five minutes after that, I've been incinerated. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. So, yeah. So okay. That was the whole deal. But the moment that I remember about it is really kind of wonderful because the shot that I, the, the actual shot that I did was me running along this road behind Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks is... Tom Cruise. I'm sorry, yes, Tom Cruise. Yeah, I'm yeah. hung up on Tom Hanks. <laughs> Different. <laughs> Tom Cruise is uh, walking really fast down this road. And I'm his boss, and I'm walking really fast, about 20 feet in back of him, uh, yelling at him that he's got to come home, right? So the whole thing takes place in the space of a block, a short block. Now, what they had was they had uh, these huge trucks going by and the cameras on the other side of the street and it's filming this scene between the wheels of trucks as they go by. You're seeing this whole thing. You're hearing my voice and Tom Cruise's voice, but you're basically seeing it through. When we, when we started doing that scene, Steven Spielberg said, Peter, come over here. And he had a, a production assistant lay down a couple of those kind of quilted blankets on the ground. And he lay down on the ground and he said, lie, lie down there, lie down here, here. Right. And they already had trucks going by because the drivers were rehearsing or maybe the trucks were just going by. I don't know what they were doing. But he wanted to show me the point of view that he was filming this scene that I was going to be in. He wanted to show me that point of view. He didn't have to do that. All I'm doing is walking after Tom Cruise, 20 feet behind him, saying, yelling at him, saying my lines. Steven Spielberg didn't have to get down on the ground and get me down on the ground to show me the point of view. I mean, I just... You know why I'm in this business? I'm in this business because I love this community of people. It, I rarely find anybody that's not giving and open and generous and creative. And that was a generous, open, giving, creative thing to do that Steven Spielberg did with a, with a guy who's going to be in his movie for three minutes. Amazing. Uh, just sorry, amazing. Another one. Another another filmmaker who is just yeah. the best and class act, all of it. Yes. Yeah, exactly. All right. So 2006, the very next year, you made a film that I think is one of this director's very best movies, talking about Spike Lee and Inside Man. And what a cast. Denzel, Jodie Foster, Clive Owen, you know, Spike Lee. It's just, I think, it's definitely, I think, 
uh, it might be his highest grossing film, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, what, like, going from someone like Spielberg to to a, a a different visionary like Spike Lee, what's what's your take on Spike Lee as a director? Uh, tell me, was it Clive? Who who were who Clive the, Owen? It was Clive Owen, but who who was who was in who was I the boss of? I uh, oh I uh, was it was it Jody Foster? No 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 she was no. who who was the Clive Owen was in the bank yeah who was yeah. who was the detective who was the lead detective who oh was... uh, uh that was uh Denzel Denzel thank you yeah, Denzel. <laughs> Gee, <really. laughs> I've I've done three um, films with Denzel don't tell him I forgot that. Don't tell him. <laughs> yeah, that's a, here's a there's another one a uh, funny funny, hardworking man. Denzel is like one of the hardest working men in all of, uh, of movie them, you know, and just a, a great guy. But boy, when he starts working, he's like a laser beam. And we had a scene and I don't remember exactly what the scene was, but I played um, Denzel's boss. Uh, I was the captain. And in fact, the next movie that I did with Denzel was called Flight and it's the movie where he saves a plane but loses some people and uh, when we first uh, got when he first came on the set with Flight and he saw me he went hey captain how are you because he remembered <laughs> me because he remembered me from uh, Inside Man I was his captain but the thing that I'm remembering right now is that there was a scene between Denzel and I um, out, outside that kind of got cut. And then at the last minute, and I think it was midnight, uh, Denzel started talking about that scene. And I mean, uh, uh, Spike started talking about that scene. And Denzel said something to the effect of, yeah, but that scene got cut. It, got, it's, it doesn't exist anymore. It got cut. And Spike said, what, what the hell do you mean it got cut? I mean, somebody cut it, and he probably okayed it, but he didn't want to cut anymore. It said some things that, and I don't remember what it was, but he, it said some things that he wanted. And he said, do you remember the scene? He said to me, do you remember that scene? And I said, yeah, I, 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 I sort of remember it. I mean, I got the... A rough draft of it in my brain and uh, Denzel said yeah I think we I don't know we got and so Spike said you you speaking of Denzel and me he says you guys you know go on down that go down that alleyway go on down that alleyway and just work it out work it out together and then come back and, uh, and uh, we'll do it okay and so me and Denzel went down to this dark alleyway and we worked on this scene for about didn't take long because it was 10 minutes and we had a good rapport and we came back and uh and spike says you, you got it i said we said yeah we got it and so he said do it let's do it i mean it's just that kind of thing of trusting trust. i guess just trusting that uh you got people who 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 really care about the material care about the essence of the material and and want to get to it and want to say okay this in this there's only maybe maybe there's only 10 lines in this particular moment but they say something about the human condition they say something about my character or or uh, and the humanity of this person or, or you know or what the what the conflict is and you trust that 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 those people that you've hired are have got that going Okay. So I I love Spike. Okay. Last last director. Oh my God. Clint Eastwood, Clint Eastwood, Changeling, Angelina Jolie, two thousand eight. Clint Eastwood is very sort of like laid back. He doesn't say action. He mm -hmm. says, what does he say? <laughs> I forget. But you're right. He doesn't say action. He says it's like uh, anytime you're ready. Yeah, when are we ready? Or, okay, go, all right, go ahead. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's very casual. It's very casual. It's kind of like what I remember about Ned Beatty working with Ned Beatty back doing homicide in Baltimore, because Ned Beatty was playing a detective, and I know this isn't your question, but 
Ned Beatty would be playing a detective, and he'd be at his desk, and he'd be taking a drink of wine. Mm-hmm. Uh, somebody would say action. Ned, there would be no change with Ned Beatty. I mean, he would just be doing his thing, and he's some, you know, other thing. And it would always read brilliantly. It would always read real. Um, um, Clint, Clint was is that 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 way, and uh, and this like what we've been talking about. I said to Clint, we did it. Uh, we did a scene once, me and Angelina, where I'm playing this cop who's uh, was a psychiatrist who's hired by the police department to basically convince Angelina that she's a nutcase, yeah. and uh, you know, and so we 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 ran through it. We. I guess it was a run through, but I think that the uh, cameras were rolling. And, you know, and I turned to Clint and I, we finished. I turned to Clint and I said, uh, uh, what, what, do you, what do you want? From, what do you want me to do here? And he said, I, I want you to do what I, I want you to do. What you want to do this? Why I hired you. I hired you because I want you to do what you want to do. But the thing that I remember, two things about that movie, if I have them, I'll tell you really quick. Is, one is that Angelina, my grandson, who his baby boy, my great-grand, is on the other side of this wall. Uh, my grandson at that time was building furniture in Montana, and he's, a, he's an artist. And um, Angelina was asking me if, uh, and I was telling her on a break, I was tell, bragging about him to Angelina, and she said, I'm looking for a birthday present for Brad. And I, so, I mean, get, get some furniture to me, get some photographs, I want to see some photographs. So there was that. That was sweet. I remember that. But what I really remember was that this story of uh, Changeling was based on a true story of mm-hmm. a kid who got uh, kidnapped. And uh, they, the Los Angeles police found another kid who seemed to fit the description. And they wanted to, they, they had a bad public relations thing at the time. And they wanted to have a success. They wanted to have a coup. And so they were trying to convince this woman that this was her son and they had found him. Right. And, the woman, and Angelina is saying, that's not my son. Mm-hmm. She's not my son, right? So that was my job to convince her she's nuts. They changed the name of the town that it was actually happened in because that scandal, uh, not that particular scandal, but the whole thing of whoever was kidnapping children was such a disaster for the town. They changed that. The, uh, the name of that town, which is east of Los Angeles in California. It's a sweet town. It's like this town that feels like it's stuck in the 1940s. And mm-hmm. little houses and streets, and you totally, no matter what day or night, you feel safe. You feel like you're back in your childhood or something. And I, on the first day that I worked on that film, Somewhere around 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock in the morning, I had gotten in costume and everything. And I'm walking down the center of this little, you know, Maple Avenue or some little American street. And I'm walking down. And I hear this voice come from the one of the porches. And the voice says, that looks like Dr. Tar. And I look on the porch and it's Clint Eastwood. And he says, come on, we're not ready yet. Come on over. So I come over and I get up on the porch and here's Clint and here's me and we're sitting and we have some time evidently and he wants to hear about my life. He says, you know, what's what's your, what are you what are you doing with your life? And I and I said, well, just recently I was running, helping to run a kind of a theatrical commune in Portland, Oregon, and uh, in the springtime in uh, April and May, I would go out, I joined a group of people who were musicians, looking at you, <laughs> and uh, we all went out into the, we would hire out through um, Warehouser of Georgia Pacific and plant trees, and at nighttime, uh, they, we'd play music, and I'm the world's worst banjo player, but I can cook. <laughs> the rest of these guys, there were about 10 of them, they'd sit around the fire and they'd play, you know, banjos and fiddles and guitars and mandolins and everything. And it would just be this mostly kind of old timey music. This is 1970, 71, 72. And um, 
So I got really good at it. I mean, my crew, oh, wow. each person could plant a thousand Douglas fir trees a day. You'd carry them in the back and we had a hoedad and you'd slap the roots in and jump down 10 feet and plant another one. And we'd plant a thousand Douglas fir trees. And, and Clint said, I, I was a, um, a lumberjack. And so he started sharing stories about when he was in his 30s or 20s or 30s wow. or whatever, mm. and he was in the mountains in a lumberjack cutting down trees. And I was in the mountains planting them, <laughs> <laughs> planting them in these huge 20 acre units on the side of a mountain where the lumberjacks had five years before cleared it for lumber. So here we are sitting, and I'm going like, this Clint Eastwood, I'm sure. <laughs> Stories with, you know, it was pretty cool. That and then at one, and then at one point, one of the guys comes over and says, "Okay, boss, we're ready." They call him boss. Wow, wow. He's Steven just, Spiel, he's just Steven, like us. Steven, <laughs> just like us. They, Steven uh, Spielberg, they call him dad. Okay, dad, we're ready. Wow. Clint would they call him boss. Okay, boss, we're ready. Wow. Nice talking to you. Yeah, nice talking. Well, Peter. Thank you. Thank you so much for this amazing conversation. Thank you for joining me on the Movie Mance Q&A. Once again, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the film Working Man is streaming now uh, on demand. It is on demand. So make sure you check out Working Man and please subscribe to my YouTube channel. And thank you so much for joining me on the Movie Mance Q&A.